All right, guys. Well, I am giving you the message today. Um, hopefully nobody uh, uh, said something during our uh life group hour and you're like, oh, I don't really want to go see Niall. But uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm the youth pastor, um, but uh, I have been looking at um, the, the passion narrative in, in, in the Bible recently, um, mainly because, yeah, Easter's coming up. Uh, and so we see, um, we see a lot of different stories. And, and I wanted to bring a passage of scripture to you guys this morning that has really been speaking to me. So first off, we're not going to be there right away, but I want you guys, if you want to turn to Luke 23, Luke 23, Luke 23, and we're going to start in verse 18, verse 18. Like I said, I'm the youth pastor and we have been talking um, a lot about about a lot of different things the past two months. And, and two of those things um, that, I, that I really want to highlight today, and it, these are, I, I'm going to steal my own thunder a little bit, but these are the main things that I want you guys to understand from this passage. It, it's what I think this passage is really trying to portray to us today. You see, the Bible isn't just something that has happened in the past, but it is speaking to us now today as much as it was to the people hearing the words in person and as much as it was to the people living when they put the words to the paper. God is speaking through his scriptures in, in order for us to see something about himself. And so I think this passage in Luke 23 is really trying to drive home a need for us. You see, we've been looking at uh, these two orthodox views in youth, and, and they are probably sick of hearing me say this because I've said this for the past two months, really driving it home so that we can get it down. And, and you might be thinking like, okay, now what are you talking about? Orthodox views. Well, orthodox is, is right belief. It means right belief, right teaching, right. And, and, and we see the beginning of orthodox. And, and you might be thinking like, oh, I know like orthodontics. <laughs> I, know, I know people getting their teeth straightened. And, and that's actually a good way of explaining what orthodox means. Uh, orth an orthodontist wants to straighten your teeth and an orthodox view, an orthodox belief is something that is right. It's a straight view of something. You see, if somebody says that they are a Christian, we assume that they have certain Orthodox views, a certain normalized views of what the Christian faith actually is. And so this passage here, I think, really drives home to Orthodox views. Now, don't get me wrong. There are a lot of Orthodox views, like the Trinity. We, if, if you say you're a Christian, you, you, you have to believe that God is uh, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. All those three things. But that, that's not what we're looking at today. And, and that's not to diminish that. But I think this is what this passage is really trying to tell us. So here are the two orthodox views that we are going to be focusing on today. And that I think God through his scripture is trying to remind us and bring us back to this. To kind of reset our viewpoint when looking at this. The first one being, we are a sinful people. We are a sinful people. We, we are, our life is naturally bent to the things of the flesh. The things that we ourselves want to do. The things that we hold on tightly to because we don't want to give up that control. We are naturally bent towards those things. We are sinful. And the second thing is, 
The second orthodox view, the second orthodox belief is that Jesus and his blood and his death on the cross frees us from those things. It sets us free from our sin. Even though we are slaves to our flesh, to our sin, God, Jesus, in his mercy, has set us free from those things through his blood and through his blood that is shed on the cross and then his resurrection that we will be celebrating in a few short weeks. I had to eat some humble pie this past Wednesday because I got mixed up on when Easter actually was. I thought it was this next Sunday and all the youth and my wife was in there and she was like, she's like, they're like, what are you talking about? Easter's two, two weeks from now. And I was like, oh, whoops, like completely messed it up. But um, so I think this passage is a good lead in to uh, where we are going with the passion narrative and everything that is going on with Jesus and his death and resurrection. So if you would turn to that passage, I said at the beginning, Luke chapter 23, and we're going to be starting in verse 18. Just a little background before we get into this is that this is Jesus in front of the crowds. And there's probably a lot of different types of people in the crowds during this. But the main thing that you need to know is that, is that there's three main characters here. One of them being Pilate, and he is kind of the governor of the city at this point. Um, he is the appointed leader of the Romans in Jerusalem. Then we have Jesus, Jesus who is the Jesus we know from the Gospels. And then there's a man named Barabbas. Barabbas. And, and you'll learn about Barabbas. You'll see what he is all about here. But this, to give a little bit of context, Jesus has been in front of multiple people up to this point. He has been in front of the Pharisees. He has been in front of Herod. He has already been interrogated by Pilate. And now Pilate, not really knowing what to do, brings him in front of the crowds to see what they say about Jesus. And so that's where we end up at. And, and this is where we start in verse 18. Read along with me. It says, but they all cried out together, away with this man and release to us Barabbas. Barabbas being a man who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection started in the city and for murder. Pilate addressed them once more desiring to release Jesus. Pilate wants to release Jesus. He, he sees that Jesus has done nothing wrong. But they kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him. A third time he said to them, why? What evil has he done? I have, let me get the next page, found him, found in him no guilt deserving of death. I will therefore punish and release him. But they were urgent, demanding with loud cries that he should be crucified. And their voices prevailed. So Pilate decided that their demand should be granted. He gave in. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder for whom they asked. But he delivered Jesus over to their will. So we see these three characters Pilate, Jesus, and Barabbas. And we, we see that there is some tension going on here, right? We see that there's some tension. And throughout history, and I, I know this might be a little bit foreign to us in this, in this day and age, but they would very much understand the idea of being a rebel, Many people would understand the idea of being a rebel. And, and you might think of a rebel today. You might think of like, uh, like somebody who listens to a lot of rock music or something like that with like the spiked up hair and like the mohawk or something. Um, so, I, so I didn't look like that 
but my parents are here, and, but they would probably attest that I was kind of a punk when I was in high school. Um, I, did, I, <laughs> I listened to the punk music. I loved the punk music. Um, if, if you want to get an idea of what I'm talking about, um, go listen to like Good Charlotte or uh, like uh, they had a song called The Anthem. Uh, if you want to hear another song, Fat Lip. Um, you can do that on your own time, but that's, that's, that's the culture. That's the music that I was growing up with. Um, and those are the things that I I kind of ascribed to. Um, I didn't look like it, but my mindset was in this punk rock rebellious state of mind. That's not saying I was like going out and getting crazy, but I, 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 I saw that there were things that I did not ascribe to. See, see, the punk rock mentality is very much rooted in, I am not going to be a part of your system. I'm not going to be your tool. I'm not going to be anything. I don't, I'm not going to give up my freedom. I'm not going to give up my independence. I'm going to do what I want. Um, and so this, this mentality, that, that's what I had when I was in high school, I very much wanted to do my own thing. Um, I'm sure if you went and asked my mom, she would be like, yeah, he, he wanted to do his own thing. He would not come home at night. Um, and I wanted him back before curfew so that the p- police wouldn't be picking him up or anything like that off of the street. Um, but I wanted to do my own thing. Uh, that, is, that is what I wanted to do. And you see, that in today's standards, that to my parents, that even even though they would probably be like, well, he was a good kid, but that was still rebellious in a sense. You see, the rebels that we're talking about in this story, they're a lot different. A rebel in times before our I would say in generally peaceful times right now, um, their rebellions and insurrections, those were scary things. Those were scary things because the people, because history, throughout history, there has been rebellions and revolutions and things that have changed and toppled empires. We even see about two to 300 years after what is taking place right here is the fall of the Roman empire. And it is because there's just rebellious German tribes to the North of the the Roman empire that, that kind of set in motion the fall of the Roman empire. You see these things, these rebels can be powerful. These rebels, they can be powerful and they can, topple entire empires. So when we see Barabbas and we see Jesus, these so-called rebels under Pilate, we can understand that there's a, there is a little bit of fear going on here. And maybe even for some people, a little bit of hope. You see, even though, yes, there is a, I am not, I don't want to be a part of your system type of mentality when it comes to my punk rock roots. I think there's also some hope in that, that, that they were looking at a world and they saw that there wasn't something that was quite right. I feel that a lot of people can understand that looking even at the past and even at the world today, that something's not quite right. There is a desire for change. There is a desire for us to be better, that there is a desire for things to be better, that God could maybe come and make things right. You see, the crowds here in this story, they may have been feeling, some of them may have been feeling a little bit of fear. Some of them might have been Romans, and they're like, 
we don't want these rebels around here. We don't want these people being insurrectionists. We don't want them taking over because that means our power is going to be diminished. And then there are some, possibly even the Jews in a basically occupied Jerusalem that wanted to see the Roman Empire fall. They wanted to see some rebelliousness, some change in the status quo. And so we, we get to this passage and we see these two figures, Barabbas and Jesus. And let's look and see what they truly stand for. So Barabbas, it, it straight up tells us exactly what he is. Verse 19, it says, Barabbas, a man who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection started in the city and murder. So this dude is not hiding how he feels. He wants to be a rebel. He wants to start something. He does not want to be under the system any longer. He made his, his desires clear. And then we have Pilate, Pilate, who is appointed as the governor over Jerusalem. He's appointed and he is meant to keep this peace. He doesn't want a rebellion underneath him. That would be awful. That means that uh, the higher ups in Rome would have to send more troops. They would have to spend more resources. That isn't what he wants. He wants to look like a good leader and that there isn't rebellion bubbling up underneath him. You see, the Romans were, even though they were corrupt and uh, they were a huge empire, and that is for good reason, um, they were adept at their military conquests. They were good at keeping people in line. And many times... That was through fear. And we especially see that, and we're gonna, we will see that as we get closer to Easter, because one of the main ways that they kept people in line is the fear of death, the fear of being tortured and humiliated in front of people who you know and love. You see, the cross was something that was to be avoided at all costs. Nobody wants to do, go through that. And the Romans knew that. The Romans knew that. So they used that as a tool to keep people in line. And so Pilate sees Barabbas and he sees Jesus and he sees a man who has literally been in prison for murder and insurrection. And he's probably thinking to himself, I do not want that man out on the streets to do the same thing that he is doing that he has already done once before. That's going to end up badly for me. And then on the other side, we have Jesus. We have Jesus. And we know Jesus. We've seen him all throughout the Gospels. This is the third book of the Gospels. Luke. And, and, and we see we have learn to understand what Jesus is about, but put yourself into Pilate's shoes. He has not been on that journey with us. He has not seen everything that Jesus has done. Instead, he is hearing from others that this man is claiming to be a king of the Jews, that he is claiming to be a Messiah, a savior for the people under his rule. And so Pilate goes to him and asks him, like, are you what you say they, they say you are? And Jesus basically says, yes, I am a king, but I am a king of something beyond what you are thinking. I am a king, and, and yes, I have things that may sound like I'm speaking rebellion, but I am doing so much more than just starting a new physical empire on this earth. 
No, Jesus's goal, Jesus's desire was to have us be a part of his new eternal kingdom. You see, many people thought that the Messiah was going to be this great military leader that was going to come and overthrow the Romans. That's what they thought. That's what they hoped. That's what they believed. This Messiah, he is going to give me back my freedom. He is going to give us back our nation. What I hold so dear to me, this Messiah is going to bring it back to me. Much like what Barabbas does, did, he is going to bring us back. He is going to topple the Romans so that I can have what I truly want. My own freedom, my own desires to be fulfilled, not to be under somebody else, not to be subjected to a giant empire. But Jesus is not that Messiah does not mean he is not Messiah. He still is Savior. But he is so much more than just a physical rebel here on earth. Jesus is calling us to a kingdom. He is calling us to be under a new type of king, a spiritual king, a king that doesn't pass away, an empire that isn't going to fall to rebellion or insurrection or anything like that, a kingdom that is not going to fall to death and sin. No, Jesus is instating a new kingdom that is so much more and that is going to last for eternity. Here's the thing. The crowds cannot see beyond what Jesus is calling them to. Jesus is calling to something them to something new, to something that is in submission to the God of the universe. But the crowds that are yelling, crucify him, want something else. Their nature, their sinfulness, their sinfulness has blinded them to what Jesus is offering them. And I cannot judge them too hard because I know exactly what I would do in that same position. And I know exactly what you would do in that same position is I would be just as blinded by what I want and my feelings and not being wanted to be ruled over by this corrupt Roman empire. I would see this and I, and I would be like, yep, you know what? I want the guy who is going to do something about my situation right now. Barabbas. The one that shows he's he's willing to go and try and do this rebellion. My sinfulness blinds me to what Jesus has for me. And that would be, that's just as true here in this passage for the crowds that we're seeing Jesus and Barabbas on trial. And it is just as pertinent as it is today with you and me. There are many times where my flesh, my desires, the things that I'm holding on to too tightly the things that I say, I cannot live without these things, these things that I'm like, where would I be if I didn't have these things? Those things blind me. They blind me in what Jesus is trying to call me towards. You see, even though Jesus was not bringing 
a physical new kingdom here on this earth, it doesn't mean that he wasn't a rebel in his own right. The things that Jesus taught us were rebellious teachings that we should love the people that we, that everybody else tells us we should hate. That we should go the extra mile for the people that are around us. That we should treat people how we want to be treated. That we should serve God with our entire heart and our entire being. And that we should do the same for the people around us. Those are just as countercultural as it is to overthrowing an empire, right? Because those change the world just the same. When we show people that we are followers of Jesus and that we are a changed people, we become ambassadors for this new kingdom that Jesus is talking about. We become ambassadors for the king to the people around us. Ambassador being somebody who brings a message to another nation, to another person, to another group. We become ambassadors. And that changes our world. When we remove the blinders, when we loosen our grip on what we think that we need. And we hand those things over to what God wants us to see. God, God's eternal kingdom. We start to see the countercultural teachings of Jesus. You see, God is so much bigger than my mess ups, than my sin than my own stupidity. What I say to our youth, me being a turd, you being a turd, that's one of my favorite things. He is bigger than that. I serve a God who is so much more than that. And I think I've, I've, I think I've used this passage every time I've preached ever since I've been here. Um, but it's, it, you don't have to turn there. I think it might be up on the screen, uh, but it's Genesis uh, chapter 50. And it's, it's the end of Joseph's story and it's the end of Genesis as a whole. But it, it, it does a good, pretty, pretty good job of giving you some context. But let me read it to you real quick because this shows how God works in our lives and how God works in the world. Read with me. This is... Chapter 50, verse 8, uh, sorry, 15. It said, when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. Joseph had a hard life. And yet God used him and brought him up out of being almost killed by his brothers, but then decided to go into slavery. And then he, he, he worked his way up in a new house and then he was brought back down thrown in prison you guys know the story joseph had a hard life and yet god used him brought him up into a place of power and now his brothers that he had just saved actually from a famine are scared that he is going to kill them because now their father is dead Verse 16, so they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgressions of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And now please forgive the transgressions of the servants of God, servants of God of your father. Joseph wept when he spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, behold, we are your servants. So Joseph, even though he's gone through all this, his brothers are coming to him saying, don't take revenge on us. Don't take revenge on us. Verse 19, but Joseph said to them, do not fear for am I in the place of God? 
It's not my place to take revenge on you. As for you, what you meant for evil against me, God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus, thus he can comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Let me just say this as I wrap up today, because I don't want to go as long as I did in first service. God is much bigger than our sins, our mess ups. He uses, he uses our mess ups. He uses Joseph, even though his brothers were sinful, God takes that sin and he turns it on its head. He takes my rebelliousness, maybe as a, as a high schooler, and he saw that, yeah, Niall, you, you do see what's wrong with the world and that there is a change. I am that change. I can be that change. It isn't through you doing your own thing. No, it's through trusting me, trusting me that I have a plan, a bigger plan than you can ever imagine. And let me tell you this, you are going to be an ambassador for me. You are going to bring that plan to the people around you. Even though you're messed up, even though you're a turd, even though you hold, you're still holding on too tightly to your own independence and your own wants, I am still going to use you. Just as he used the crowds during Jesus' trial. Would we say that it's good that they wanted to crucify Jesus because they wanted to see the Roman Empire fall? No, I would never say that. But God is much bigger than that, and he uses, he uses that to bring about the most important thing in history. Jesus' death and his shed blood on the cross that saves us from ourselves, saves us from our sin, and redeems us and puts us on a different path of life. God is a much, God is a humongous God. And he can use whatever he needs in order to bring about his plan. Don't doubt that. So as I close today, where are you at in this? We're all in that crowd. And I can guarantee you we would be saying the same thing. Crucify him. But have you repented? And do you recognize that God can use you beyond that? God is bigger than what you have done in the past. God is bigger than what you are going to do in the future. He can still use you. So are you willing to allow him to use you? Are you willing to allow him to use you to be that ambassador to those around you? Also, if you have never come to that relationship with Christ, let me challenge you. Why not? We serve a humongous God that can change even the bleakest circumstances into amazing miracles. Won't always look pretty. I know for sure it hasn't always looked pretty in my life. But it's still good. It's still good, and, and, and Jesus is going to do that. He's working with us into eternity. Think on that. I'm going to ask the, the band to come on up as we end in prayer. Um, so if you would, just bow your heads as, as we close up today. But God... I, God, I just ask that you would be with these, be with me, be with the people here today, that they, that they can hear your words, that your kingdom is so much more 
than being in control of our own destiny. But God, that we hand that over to you and that we trust that you are good and that you will use us for your end. God, I pray that if there's anybody in here that who does not have a relationship with you, that they would come to know you better through today, through the songs, through the message, and that they would come speak with somebody maybe that they know, maybe another Christian that they know, that they would come talk with somebody. God, we, we just ask that you would change hearts. That you would take us from that crowd that's yelling crucify him and bring us into something new. God, use us. Lord, we love you and thank you in your name. Amen. There's going to be some people down here. There's some people in the back. If you need prayer, please don't, please come and get prayer. If, if you don't want to be up in front of everybody, there's some people in the back. Or maybe ask somebody next to you to pray for you. That is humongous. That is humongous. And, and, and God will use that. Trust me. God can use that. So as we worship, talk with God. Talk with somebody else.